Why don't I start out by telling you some of the tales about how the weavers got started in the bee business. So I gotta go way back yonder. Uh, my grandmother and her family came from Florida to Texas from the Suwannee River country uh, when she was an infant uh, back in right after the Civil War. And they settled about five miles from where we live. My grandfather came from Georgia after the Civil War. And by the way, just a little aside, uh, he says that when the Civil War ended, he was the oldest male in his community, and he was 14. And Dad didn't know until he went back over there that their home place was not very far from the infamous Andersonville prison place. But anyway, grand Grandpa came over and settled there at Lynn Grove, where we live now. It's called Lynn Grove because of its Lynn trees, and Lynn trees produce good honey. Well, my grandmother's brother had always wanted to have bees. And one day, they were walking home from school, and there was a swarm of bees. Now, I never did hear any story about who may have had bees around there, where the swarm may have come from. But anyway, he found a swarm of bees. Oh, he wanted that swarm of bees. So being an inventive, he slipped off into the brush, pulled down his breeches, pulled off his long handles that everybody wore in those days, tied up the pants legs, shook the swarm into his long handles, and carried them home. And that was the start of the weaver's bee. <laughs> Later, uh, my grandfather's wife died, and uh, uh, my grandmother and her brothers decided they needed, they had enough bees, they needed an out yard, and so they wanted to move bees down on Grandpa's place for the Lynn trees. And so it was a day's work to go in a wagon and work the bees and extract the honey. They put the, the extractor on the wagons and whatnot. So Grandma went along to cook and everything. The next thing you know, well, Grandma and Grandpa got married, and the brothers gave them ten hives of bees for a wedding present. So back in 1888, well, we got 10 hives of bees to start bee weaver, weaver apiary. My dad always wanted to be the best beekeeper possible. And so he went out and worked for several beekeepers around the, around the state. Uh, I think his first job away from home. Uh, there was a man that uh, lived over at New Bronzeville that wrote in all the bee journals. And so dad just couldn't wait to get a job with him to learn beekeeping because this expert beekeeper is writing in all the bee journals. So dad went over there and the man loaded him into his buggy and at New Bronzeville, you know, there's this escarpment up there. Took him up there and he says, Roy, there's a bee yard in that place, and that place, and that place, and that place. And here's your wagon and a mule, and here's an old man to help you go take off the honey. And that's all the, extra all the instructions he ever got <laughs> from that man about beekeeping. And uh, so, anyway, uh, finally, uh, he and my mother had worked for a, another big beekeeper out in the uh, El Paso area one year. And then in uh, 1925, well, uh, this man wanted dad to work for him in uh, Colorado. And uh, they were having a, a terrible year for the crops. And so dad went out there. And... Uh, there he met a man from uh, Europe who had uh, worked at a bee lab there and knew how the new system of grafting for raising queen bees. And so dad learned grafting from Matt. So he came back and raised a few queen bees 
And at that time, well, there were two large beekeepers in the state, T.W. Burleson, or the founder of the Burleson's Honey Company that you see Burleson's Honey everywhere, and H.E. Graham in Cameron. And those two men said, Roy, if you will raise the queen bees, we'll promise to buy a thousand queen bees every year. So with that, with that promise, well, Dad started raising, raising queens. And so we've been in the, in the queen rearing business since that time. Uh, let's fast forward through some of the Depression years. And uh, in 1936, well, we took what was for country people in that day quite a trip. Uh, we went to Colorado, where this Mr. Stallman that Dad had worked for in El Paso had a place, and uh, got reunited with this Matt Nicholson, the uh, European that uh, Dad had got to know and taught him how to graft and whatnot. And so uh, they were having a tremendous honey crop and Matt couldn't keep up with his bees, were all plugging out. And so dad and my brothers, I was still just a kid, uh, we stayed a couple of weeks to help him, him with extracting and whatnot. And so then we started moving bees each summer to Colorado. And later we got an outfit in North Dakota that we uh, kept bees out there and whatnot. And so in, a, in addition to queen bees and as an adjunct to the queen bees, well, the package bee business grew. And uh, when I was... I was in high school during the war years, World War II years, and when I graduated at 16, all the, and Dad hired young men, kids from the area to work. Well, all of them were in the Army. So instead of going on to college, I laid out of, out of high school and at 16 became the queen boss of her outfit. So I, I, had, to, I had done it all my high school years in a part time, but I had to all of a sudden learn how to be a real beekeeper. And uh, so uh, I've been raising queen bees as the major part of my, my life since 1944. Uh, in that time, uh, our bees have, have changed quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> when I was a little kid, well, uh, uh, good bees were real bright yellow. And then we started hearing about the Caucasian bees. And so my uncle Howard was in the business with Dad at the time. And so we started raising Caucasian bees up at Howard's place. And then after we divided up, well, Howard kept the Caucasians, we kept the Italians, and then uh, Brother Adam with his Buckfast bee was the, uh, was the going thing. So we started raising the Buckfast bee, and yeah, it was a good bee. Then we've raised the Daydant Starline bees. And uh, while Bud Kale, the developer of the Starlines, was alive, well, yeah, they had a good bee, but uh, uh, it just didn't seem to be the same after, after Bud left. And uh, all along, we have believed and selecting from our stock from the, the best doing colonies. And after you see that they build up good and strong, 
they made you a good honey crop, well, then you start looking at them more closely. And, of course, the thing that you want to select for first nowadays is for gentleness. Because we do have some introduction of Africanized strains in our part of the state. They're not here full force by any means. But if you find that mean colony of bees, you need to find that queen and pinch her head and get you a new queen because you don't want to generate that mean stock by letting her put out drones and to mate with any virgins that they raise when they swarm and whatnot. And I think that's the only way that we will keep control of our stock if we, if we do a good job of eliminating those vicious boogers. Uh, back when the Africanized bees were, were certainly coming this direction, well, uh, I was part of a group that uh, just kept pestering the uh, government to do some research about them. And they opened a uh, lab in Venezuela. And a group of us went down there to that lab to see it full force. They're scary, folks. Uh, they had us, they made sure that we all had coveralls and veils and gloves and everything. And we'd take this little bus out and the bus would stop out away from the bee yard, long way away. We'd get all suited up and go into the bee yard and the bees would just 